Um, I'm happy to invite you to today's CME. And I think we will have a very exciting uh, presentation and I'm hoping it will stimulate uh, exciting discussion. Our presenter today is Dr. Dorothy Mutier. Dr. Dorothy Mutier is an ophthalmologist and a lecturer as well as a researcher. She's been uh, teaching at the KMTC, I think since 2008, when she qualified as an ophthalmologist. She holds an MSc in uh, public eye health, which she completed at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She has also undertaken uh, a course in leadership at the Strathmore University. And uh, she has uh, published and is uh, uh, cited in se by several writers. And I think we are very lucky to have Dr. Dorothy Mutier today uh, taking us through today's CME. Welcome, Dr. Dorothy Mutier. Thank you, Dr. Kimani, for those very kind words. I was wondering whether this, that's, that's me, but thank you very much. Um, so uh, dear colleagues, good evening. Um, I hope I am audible. Yes, you are, Dr. Ari. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, so I'd like to thank the OSK team for the opportunity to discuss Matters ethics are seen in the practice of uh, public health. And uh, so um, today's session really picks up from where Dr. Gishui discussed uh, uh, um, last time on evidence-based medicine. So before this, let, allow me to share my screen. <clears throat> Okay. And so picking up from where Dr. Gishuhi left last time, um, where we looked, we basically looked at uh, patients or rather the focus was uh, on patients. So today's session now looks at the wider population. And uh, when we consider both public health practice and research, we, we look at uh, whole populations or, or communities and um, the exposure they have uh, probably been in contact with and then consider the outcomes. And just like in um, uh, uh, individual-based or clinical research, this cycle um, uh, uh, exists as well. So we have a population and assess either the needs or uh, emerging issues in that population. And after making assess an assessment then, there is um, the decision-making uh, step. And once decisions are made, then the actions or interventions to be undertaken are implemented in that population. And after that, again, um, the outcomes and the events following, uh, following that um, intervention are assessed and the cycle continues. And so, and uh, since the, the, the center is population, populations, remember this is a, um, composed of many uh, different types of people um, in terms of ideas, in terms of sizes, in terms of um, origins. So it becomes a, a, a bit, uh, or rather it brings different uh, aspects of ethics, even as we consider public health practice and research. And so um, to guide us through this presentation, what I will do is I will make a few remarks regarding um, the principles governing ethics in public uh, health practice and research. Um, then I will give us a snippet of case studies from Kenya. And uh, using these two case studies, we will uh, um, then 
consider the, how these principles are applied. In the process, there'll be many questions to be asked. And as uh, Dr. Kimani said, this hopefully will trigger um, discussions. So uh, uh, some of these questions may not have answers. And uh, I will invite us to also give inputs into this. So um, after, after discussing the application of the principles, I'll make a few remarks on data management, which will now uh, pave the way for questions, comments, and answers, and then we'll be done. All right, so to uh, begin, I would like to just mention that um, um, when we consider activities in public health, we may actually need to divide them into two. Those are uh, research-based and those that are non-research-based. And why would this uh, be necessary? Part of the reason is because um, when we consider the, the principles that we will discuss, um, the ethical matters may be different. And these are some of the questions that may arise. So are the ethical matters carrying these two different activities different? And uh, what is the purpose of each activity? For example, the research-based activities, um, what is their purpose? And what is the intent of the activity? Is it experimentation? And so um, as we consider those questions, we'll realize that uh, research, or we'll, just to remind us that research will generally contribute to uh, the knowledge and practice, uh, and uh, to general knowledge, while the practice of public health will be more geared to safeguarding the health of those within a certain jurisdiction, say a county or a country or a village and so on, as long as there is a community of people. And then in general research activities tend to be given more oversight and more and are subjected to stringent standards. So um, with this, looking at the various activities that we may encounter in public health. Some of them may be easy to classify as research or non-research. However, others are a bit um, challenging to uh, uh, classify. Now, in that picture, I think uh, we are familiar with this um, picture, at least uh, quite a number of us, and some of us have encountered patients who used this um, product for management of eye problems. So the question would be, um, or, and maybe I would even invite those who have had followed that, that conversation, looking at what the team actually did. So in order to act, do, do we need to conduct a whole study? And from the discussions, I am sure um, we didn't actually conduct much of a study. Actually, uh, people gave their comments and um, a few other uh, spoke about their experiences and action began. And so um, this really should uh, highlight or at least help us appreciate that public health activities may not necessarily need to be uh, subjected to the same principles as uh, research because there are situations where action is required urgently and uh, for the greater public good. All right, so let's look at what constitutes uh, the principles of public health ethics. So they are similar to what uh, is applied in clinical ethics. It's just that the target and the audience is different. And so we will have this three key ones. I'm sure in some literature, actually, you have a few others. But when you look at them critically, they will fall into one of these three. So one would be respect for persons. But now in public health, we consider respect for communities or a community. Then when we look at uh, beneficence, it's about doing no harm, maximizing benefits, and minimizing harm. So that really would still apply to communities as well as individuals. And then finally, we have justice. Justice has to do with equitable distribution of both benefits and risks. And so um, as we uh, consider these principles, um, allow me to just share uh, a bit about two um, 
advise a program or uh, research activities that will have been undertaken in our country in the past and even ongoing, and we will learn from them. And um, at least I think I saw Prof. Karimorio, and um, hopefully we'll also be able to contribute where necessary. I'm hoping also Dr. Rono will be available to contribute um, as they touch on projects both have undertaken. So the first um, case study uh, would be on trachoma programs in Kenya. So briefly, I know there's a lot about the programs, but this is just the brief and then uh, just the brief. So the outcomes of um, undertaking these programs was to prevent, initially was to prevent blindness due to trachoma. And now the expected outcome is actually elimination of trachoma in the country. And some of the activities undertaken were mass drug administration and surgery as part of the safe uh, strategy. So when you consider public health um, a practice, but uh, from the ophthalmology side of it, these are the two activities that we could do. Um, and these were done, uh, or rather at least 18 uh, trachoma endemic uh, uh, had been identified with the ophthalmic services unit taking the lead, but joined by a consortium of different players. So that is the brief regarding trachoma programs. Then we have um, the peak school eye health and the peak community eye health. So this, um, the two uh, uh, were undertaken and still uh, ongoing at, uh, in, within Transoia County in Kenya. And if we look at the peak school eye health, the, uh, this was concerned with, uh, with screening for visual impairment and the outcomes there were one to validate the pick up for school screening, and the second one was to scale it up. Then regarding the community eye health, this is a cluster randomized trial where uh, the idea is to identify, um, to compare identification of persons with eye problems using the peak community screening app versus the current community screening approaches. So the outcome is, in their words, early identification and um, improved adherence to referral. So they want to see which of these two then would uh, lead to this outcome. So I hope um, that gives us a snippet of the two, uh, uh, the, or more or less three, three programs or projects and research uh, activities, which will help us in discussing the principles of um, public health practice and research ethics. So the first one, when you look at respect for community, now this has to do with cap the capacity to decide, making decisions, um, informed consent, inherent value in individuals and protection of the all vulnerable populations and autonomy. But what does this look like when it comes to community? An individual, it is easy to decide. Informed consent, probably they can do that for themselves, but how, do uh, communities give consent? And do populations have rights where we have individual rights or duties? So what does informed consent look like? And is it possible to uh, place the higher good but not, uh, not diminish the value of the individual? Remember now we are talking about individuals in a community, but we are looking at the higher good for the community, for the betterment of the community. And um, Again, there, there is the issue of vulnerable populations who tend to also call for greater interventions, say maybe due to poverty or maybe special needs, yet often they hardly participate. So how can this be encouraged so that um, their, their decision making is made from a point of information? So this would be the question one needs to consider. Um, uh, if they are to pay attention to respect for community. And is it possible? Is it doable? So let us see what happened or what has happened in practice. So um, as far as consent is concerned, often community leaders and household health heads have been utilized to provide consent. So when we look at the trachoma mass drug administration, in this case, chiefs and DOs were utilized. 
what happened they were uh, pro, uh, the teams that uh, wanted to do these activities approached the chiefs and the DOs. I remember that time we still had districts, so that's why we uh, were talking about officers at that time. So these were the people who were approached to provide uh, and given the information. And it was assumed or uh, it was assumed that once the chiefs accepted the proposal, um, it was taken as um, community acceptance. And so the chiefs and the DOs informed the people. And at that time, chiefs and DOs words were law. And so everybody complied and received their uh, azithromycin. Um, so, and then for TT surgery, um, because it was a surgical procedure, written consent was provided. However, the question was, was it informed consent? I mean, and given by individuals. So was it informed? So these are some of the challenges that the trachoma uh, program uh, faced. If this was to be done again, all over again now, definitely um, getting consent would take a, different, a slightly different um, tangent and would uh, adhere to some more stringent standards. So let's look at the school screening done in Transoia. Now, initially, because this was to use, uh, this was designed to use um, an app, uh, uh, an app, and this was this is a digital a digital device. So, the initial intent was to validate that tool to show that it can actually be used for school screening. Remember, school screening for visual impairment use you would uh, was. Um, undertaken using uh, Snellen's charts and so uh, um, Snellen's charts. And, uh, but uh, in this case, here was a new app needed to be used in school screening. However, uh, their intent was to use it and see whether it would work. So the first uh, hurdle they had, they met was uh, not the first hurdle, but um, the first hurdle that they had to overcome was to, make the decision to split the, the project into two. First, validate it. Then after that, you can now carry out the study. And so that's what uh, they had to do. And they had to do the first phase of validating the pick up against what was the standard at that time. Only after validating were they allowed now to see how well it would work in the uh, public, um, in the general population. And then the next was, how do you get consent from minors? Because you are basically going into schools. Was it with the teachers? Was it the parents? Teachers, why teachers? Um, students, while uh, in school, generally they are under the custodian of the teachers. And of course they have their parents. So who was to give consent here? Is it the teacher? Was it the parents? So, um, so how did they overcome uh, sorry, and then there was another one. There was the potential um, for segregation. You know, after screening, then uh, the information was to be sent to all the parents. An SMS saying that your child has been screened and needs further um, uh, assistance. So initially, only those parents whose children had failed the screening test were supposed to get the SMS. But this would potentially create some form of discrimination or segregation. And so it was decided that um, all parents will get an SMS saying that their child had been screened. And then after that, those who needed further uh, interventions uh, got uh, um, uh, more information and how to do it. So this is how um, uh, that in the, um, the, the aspect of consent was uh, undertaken and we can see the differences in the two programs, trachoma in the early um, uh, uh, 2000s uh, 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 versus the school screening in the, uh, in the recent past. So there've been a bit of um, difference in terms of how to consent and ensuring that it's taken uh, versus the other time when um, just mass cons consent was allowed. Now, when it comes to the community screening that is an, uh, ongoing, um, everyone has to consent and, and or assent. So 
they are doing, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 um, this community screening involves about 128,000 uh, people and all of them, all those households were visited and everyone above 18 had to consent and then anyone below there would give their assent and then the head of the household would give the consent. So this, the, the matters are becoming more and more stringent. Later in, the, in today's presentation, we'll talk about uh, uh, data and data protection. So in, uh, when we consider consent uh, in uh, the public health, so the general rule is to use the gatekeepers for entry into the community. That is the first step. But after that, individuals must also give their, their consent and this should be documented. Um, one of the things that uh, was highlighted by the um, informants giving information about uh, trachoma programs was that actually there was no documentation about consent. So I believe now, hopefully, we can see that this is a critical info informed consent should be taken. We now move on to the second uh, principle of beneficence. And as we said earlier on, uh, beneficence has to do with uh, doing no harm. And the next one is maximizing benefits to the community and minimizing harms in uh, populations. Now, but when you consider um, some of the interventions that um, are taken, well, some of the health promotion interventions can be quite intrusive or even very paternalistic. And so um, the uh, question is, um, so uh, how can the individual or how do communities handle this? Sometimes the needs of the public may actually override the individual rights. For example, if I may consider it my right to smoke, but um, if smoking will harm the bigger uh, population, then there will be a no smoking policy, for example, uh, adopted in particular places. So the needs of the public here override that individual right, although to some extent it is provided for. So whenever now any intervention needs to be um, made or um, undertaken, then there is need to convince individuals that certain actions are good for them. For example, in the recent past, even now, we are, an, uh, uh, we are having this virtual meeting because of COVID restrictions. So when you ask, when, uh, if you ask yourself who convinced you to wear masks or to keep uh, social distancing or washing your hands, um, I don't think any of us even uh, ever give consent, but we are actually doing them. So you'll realize that when um, we consider um, uh, the greater good for communities, sometimes the, jury, the, the, the ones in charge of uh, that particular jurisdiction need to take decisions for the benefit of the community. And um, the uptake of those interventions will really depend on, this, on uh, that particular condition. For example, diseases that kill very fast are likely to promote a faster acceptance, probably because we were so scared about this new disease and COVID. All of us actually locked ourselves in our houses and we, we masked ourselves and so on. So, um, uh, and even up to now, um, we are taking the vaccine and I'm not sure any of us has uh, given any consent anywhere. So um, that's just an example of how um, health promotion interventions can actually be um, imposed on, com on communities. Let's see a bit more. Let's uh, discuss this a little more when we consider trachoma. Now, um, I wonder if the, the communities were asked whether they wanted any intervention. Were their perspectives sought? Did they perceive the interventions that were given as their uh, needs? or uh, were there other needs, more pressing needs? And who made this decision? Who decides the decisions that need to be made, uh, that need to be, I mean, the actions that need to be done in a community? Is it a university in Japan? Suppose, I mean, for example, 
or an NGO from Canada that decides, ah, we want to reduce blindness in somewhere. Let's decide. Um, we throw a dice and decide it's Kenya. And oh yeah, their prevalence is very, you know, the prevalence of um, say trachoma or whatever it is, disease, we can go and intervene. Yet um, none of us is really involved in that. And again, as I had highlighted earlier, the most deprived might need more interventions, yet least, uh, least likely to uh, participate. So where is the, um, I'm even bringing the aspect of justice here. So who decides? The, uh, the aspect of non-medics for managers, I know this might not look like, um, like a public health, really. However, I believe this, this really brought a lot of heated discussions in the group where we wondered how can non-medics manage health facilities or manage us. So, but this really squarely puts us in the same fit, in the same boat that communities feel when somebody makes a decision on their behalf without consulting them. Now, leaving that aside, data was collected for trachoma programs still being collected. And this trachoma data actually was shipped out of the country. So the fact that this data, including the raw data actually, and even cleaning was done out of the country. So did this do harm or did it do good? So these actions, um, sh what should have been done? We will talk a little bit more about this when we consider data um, protection later. When we now look at the school health, how do, have they handled the aspect of beneficence? When they first did the screening, uh, after doing the validation of the tool, uh, only a, 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 a small part of Transoia was screened. Children in a particular area were screened. However, there was so much interest and um, it proved the outcomes were quite good such that screening had to be scaled up. So the greater good of the community had to be considered so that all the other uh, children could be included. Sometimes um, some information is not, not all the information is given to the public, sometimes to reduce anxiety maybe so that people don't panic at the huge numbers they are seeing or such things. But does that do more harm than good? Is it better to hide some information? Should we, um, for example, if we do a survey and find that um, a certain group in say Nyandarwa um, drink a lot, should we make that public? Such that the next time I introduce myself and I say I'm from Nyandarwa, the first thing you think about me is that, oh, you are from that place where there are drunkards. So question is, should such information be availed to the public? Um, but I don't know if you are involved directly. Okay, uh, I think somebody needs to mute somewhere. So, um, so um, should we give out all the information? How, um, what, um, does it cause more harm than good? I think those are some of the questions we would probably ask ourselves. And uh, when we consider, okay, this is especially when we consider public health uh, practice. When we look at research-based activities, remember we said earlier on that research, um, activities are subjected to more stringent standards. So um, the methodology uh, will be thoroughly scrutinized. So um, some of the public health activities, actions taken by governments and uh, other authorities actually may, may, may pass. But if they were subjected to research ethics and um, uh, ethical commu uh, committees, they probably not pass because some of the these uh, principles are not being followed. So for research activities, one must actually put in place um, all that is required to ensure that the community does not suffer any harm and then any benefits are maximized. All right, so I will now um, uh, look at justice. And when we look at um, justice, it's a lot to do with health equity. 
a fair distribution of health outcomes and risks and benefits. So what does um, this look like? It also involves access to determinants of health, for example, nutrition and vaccination. Um, we have been in this situation where we, there is a need to vaccinate the whole population or at least a, a, a significant uh, portion of, this, uh, of the population, but we have vaccines missing. So um, you can, I, I believe we are seeing the efforts being made to procure more vaccines because really um, it is only just and fair to ensure that those who need vaccines get them. Unfortunately, resources are scarce. And that's why there's such a, I mean, there's such um, tension between, so what should receive these resources? How do we make that decisions? So how was that, oh, how was uh, this, uh, how did this look like for trachoma? So for the trachoma program, of course, um, everybody, well, when it, um, the, the groups that needed a mass drug um, administration had to be given. So part of the program included procuring adequate azithromycin to ensure everyone who needed it got it. So that was a justice in action. However, that was just one aspect of safe strategy. There are other sectors that needed to do their part in terms of uh, water supply and sanitation. Unfortunately, that has not matched the surgery, the S and the drug administration arms of the safe uh, strategy. So is this really justice for those communities? We are talking about um, eliminating trachoma. Actually, it was supposed to have been by 2020, but um, because of the poor performance in the other sectors, then um, that was not achieved primarily because, okay, not, let me not use the word primarily, but a lot also had to do with the uh, below performance of the other sectors. So again, when considering justice, when considering any intervention in a public health, um, in the public health domain, then every sector, every sector must play its part. Um, if one was doing a risk, I mean, if this program was, uh, was a, um, put through um, ethics and research committee, it probably would not go through until they show that the, all the, 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 the four arms of the strategy can be done. And or it would have been stopped midway because the, 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 the sanitation aspect is not being done because now justice is not being uh, applied. Um, let's look at, um, say an area that has a high prevalence of glaucoma. Now we know that uh, we don't quite have a screening method at the moment that can help us identify people, easily identify people who have glaucoma or at least identify it at the early stages for intervention. So is it fair to channel resources elsewhere? What really is just in this case? What would you do? Would you uh, allocate resources there? remember they are scarce, or um, uh, just to ensure that people don't go blind. So um, again, even while trying to apply the principle of justice in public health, it is not a very easy aspect. It's not a very easy thing to do, many decisions to make. Now, having looked at respect for community beneficence and justice, um, there's still more, yeah, there's still a little more on justice, sorry. Um, we remember recently there was, um, uh, we were engaged in trying to contribute to the development of the essential medical list so that at least um, every facility would have some minimum required drugs. So um, I believe this is justice in action because um, that is what do I say people in authority do or uh, people who are in charge of communities do. They look for the good of the community. It may possibly not be for individuals because rather than possibly one would prefer to give say a Latanoprost, for example, for management of glaucoma, 
However, it may be it's an expensive therapy, too expensive to be sustained. So the government or the authorities decide, let's avail Timolol instead, even though would probably prefer an, a different drug. So a, essential medical list and such also um, can be seen as uh, activities that are undertaken for the greater good of the community. And so um, efficiency really must be accompanied by moral applicability, trying to detangle um, this from economics. What is the bottom line, you know? Um, maybe this question, I don't know whether, uh, what our opinion is regarding um, the COVID-19 vaccine that uh, had been brought in by private practitioners. So is it ethical to allow private practitioners to bring it in and then charge for it when ideally everyone should get it? So is it ethical? So those are, those are some of the questions that um, um, are still out there for people to debate and um, um, give their opinion. When it comes to research and justice, again, um, any research, um, for, uh, done within the public health domain must again have a, a demonstrate a fair distribution of the risks and benefits. And when, it, uh, when you consider research, there's also the aspect of recruitment of participants. So you must provide opportunity for equal chance for participation, not just, not just choosing particular people because they are likely to answer or participate or give the right or give the expected answer. In research, again, all vulnerable populations must be protected and um, the proposals must actually demonstrate how these uh, populations will be protected. For example, uh, children, um, pregnant women, people in prisons. So if we decide to do a screening program, say for prisoners, check whether they have vitamin A deficiency, then would need to um, enumerate very well how we will protect uh, protect them. So a question, I don't know if uh, Dr. Rono has a, a, is in, but um, this would be a question that um, would seek to ask, why did PIC choose public schools for the validation study? Why not include everyone, including those in private schools? It would be interesting to hear some of these answers, but these are some of the challenges, uh, and I know from the the discussion we had, um, I had with him, um, these are some of the difficult decisions that one has to make whenever trying to do some of this, uh, conduct some of the res uh, research activities. So to wind up that bit on, um, uh, and conclude on research in public health, one more thing, I mean, one also has to consider personal and professional ethics of, um, uh, of it and include the, the values of integrity and honesty, confidentiality and anonymity. So that then um, I don't, I as an individual don't collect data and go and manipulate it to meet my own needs. Um, the, other need, the other thing to just point out is that uh, research in public health can be carried out by practitioners affiliated to public health institutions, as well as those affiliated to private institutions and NGOs. This is to try and differentiate it from public health uh, activities, which usually are carried out by uh, public institutions and maybe persons who are affiliated to those uh, institutions. But for research, it must undergo independent verification by a review committee. However, the other public health activities usually don't necessarily undergo that. So a brief uh, look at data management before we wind up, and this is to do with the uh, data collection and consent. So in the public health domain, often data collection can conflict with the right to privacy. And I'm sure we have all come across situations in which we feel our privacy has been intruded. An SMS are telling you that you now qualify for a certain loan and you wonder, okay, uh, I didn't ask for that information. Um, but when it, uh, okay, sorry, I mentioned that, uh, I think I mentioned that in the previous slide. Um, but when we consider um, the data that is collected, whether by the local authorities or by individuals, and especially 
uh, that collected by individuals and institutions. Who owns this data? And where is it stored? Should privately owned institutions give data to local authorities? And if an outreach is conducted, say for a, 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 a cut, uh, for say cataract um, uh, uh, case um, finding, who owns those statistics? So is it the, the local authority within which that camp was conducted, especially, um, or is it the institution that carried out the outreach, especially if it was external? Um, if they go ahead and do, say, cataract surgery, so uh, where, who really, uh, uh, how do we account for that data? Cataracts were found in area A, but surgery done in area B by institution Z. So who really, where should that data be placed? When we consider also qualitative methods of data collection, often uh, uh, some may think that really um, there is really no need for consent or that really there's no harm. But actually psychological space is entered because you, uh, uh, we're asking information from individuals. And when you consider focus group discussions, should we get consent? Is it group or individual consent? For in-depth uh, in interviews, because one is giving personal experiences, then consent is required. Uh, for key informant interviews, do we need consent? Because remember they are giving information about events, things maybe they have um, engaged in an activity, but not really about themselves. So do we need consent there? Photographs. Um, I don't know how many of us really get um, uh, consent to use photographs that we have taken of patients or even work we are doing in the community. Probably we are doing a cataract outreach or a school screening and there we are taking photographs. Actually, you're supposed to take separate consent for using anyone's face. And uh, so that is separate from the other consent for participation. When it comes to secondary data, say from health institutions or, you do, or uh, in a disease surveillance um, project or data from uh, sites, uh, data, I mean, disease surveillance sites or routine data from project programs, how do we go about um, say consent or who gives consent in these situations? What, is, what are the ethical questions that would arise about this? The patient came, a patient came, was seen, uh, in a facility, and then now we are using their data. They didn't give consent for that. And many of our health institutions don't ask for that consent. Probably it's time we started instituting that as part of our routine day-to-day um, -day care of our patients, that your data might be used for research. Now, um, the digital space is an interesting one because now we it has permeated all spaces, even what we considered private. And there are all manner of data being collected left, right, center, including maybe even quality of sleep, IOP measurements, things that we probably think are good for, for individuals. But where is that data going? Community surveys via mobile phones. And then we are told that, oh, this data is stored in the cloud. How protected is it? Do we have access? Do we know whether, how, um, can I, see that information? Is it possible for me to decide whether it is safe or not? Data that is collected by non-residents of a country, uh, maybe sent by a phone or a computer app to a server that is abroad. What is, uh, is that ethical? Yeah. And um, I think we talked about this as, hap as happened in the trachoma uh, program, but this was before the data protection laws uh, error. And so probably now these things would be different. And that is why for the peak programs, they've had to comply with data protection laws. And what does the data protection law look like? We have the act there, which was enacted in 11th November 2019. So it is there by law. And I borrowed this other slide from Deloitte and Tush, who have attempted to summarize it. And actually now there are penalties for non-compliance and one would be required to 
ensure that all data collected from, like for example, in this area, all data collected in, uh, uh, from subjects residing in Kenya, even if the, uh, the company is located elsewhere, must provide a copy within the country. And actually that was what, that's part of what PIC has done. Um, they, there is a server in Kitale in Transoya um, County. So there is a copy of all the data that has been collected. Yeah, and before any is transferred, the data protection authority is supposed to uh, be aware, the data commissioner is supposed to give any, uh, to give permission for any data to be transmitted outside the country. And so you can have a look at the data protection act so that next time you consider doing a research project and um, even with um, an external partner, you know what to do. And on that point, if there is an external partner who wants to, or rather someone external who wants to do uh, research in Kenya now, they must have a corresponding a PI in Kenya. And um, as we have said, there must be a server within the country. And so there are all manner of things that need to be done. So we will not be able to exhaust all of them, maybe a topic for another day. So in conclusion and taking home, so every situation is unique, especially in communities, because they are so, so varied. What is right in one community may not be right in another one. So whenever we are looking at doing any interventions for communities, there is the importance of getting uh, community consent through participation. And basic principles of respect, beneficence, and justice must still be adhered to as far as is possible. But we know that for public health activities, there are some that are carried out by the authorities that may not necessarily be subjected to this because of the greater common good. So be aware of all the laws that govern research and practice, and we should keep up with the digital space because it is expanding day by day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mutie, for that uh, uh, thorough uh, discussion on ethical issues in public health. And I think the floor is now open for anybody with uh, any questions. Uh, Dr. Rono, you are, I think you are there. I don't know whether you'd like to comment something more regarding the PIC uh, research and the ethical issues that you had to address? Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Mutie, Dr. Kahaki for the presentation and also for the opportunity to respond to some of the, the questions that, um, and, and issues that arise from this topic. Yes, it must be understood that when you are doing this a study, it was actually a novel place. We, nobody had done it before. So we're actually going through most of these things for the first time. And uh, Dr. Mutia rightly said that for the school screening program in Transoya, when we were doing the RCT, we had to split it into two because when we had come up with the app, we didn't know whether it was going to work or not. So one, we had to split it into two, basically to validate it and to make sure that the results that you are going to get when you put it as a public health intervention, it was as accurate as if we were to use the existing uh, technologies. And with that, we had to, of course, um, take about six months to do that. But it, it, uh, from hindsight now, that actually helped us in creating um, a pool of people who knew exactly what PIC was going to do because we had teachers who had used it before. We had parents who had actually, who children had actually been screened with that and they had actually explained to. So when we, when we went back to now getting the consent from the parents in the larger RCT involved in 50 schools, it was very easy to involve the teachers in case the, the parents had the um, issues. So in the first bit, the first um, comment I have was that, I think Dr. Mutia talked about the challenges we had in getting consent with minors. One of them is that we, for every minor or a child, it's the parent who actually has to consent. But in Kenya also, the, the, the children are in school, so the parents, the, the teachers have to give 
uh, agree or to give a, um, an agreement or concurrence with that. So we actually have to get concurrence from the school authorities and then send each parent a information sheet and they, re they read it and if they had questions, they actually have to call us. So I had actually a team of a composed of a teacher, myself and some nurses who would basically answer some of those questions which were, I mean, about the project. And we received quite a number of uh, questions about that. Some of them were skeptical, they don't accept, but eventually when the screening went on, they, they called back and said they, they, they had refused and they wanted their children to be screened. So also in public health as well, allow for that element of um, um, people reconsenting later on. They can withdraw from the study, but they can also enter the study again. So you have to have both of those opportunities to give them. So I think uh, that was one of the things that we did. So, so to avoid um, biasness in terms of which arm they would go to, so we had to get the phone contacts, the consent from all the parents, and we did um, differentiation afterwards. That's how we, we, we managed to avoid the biasness in that data. So we, we, you, you get the consent before you, you allocate to the arms which, where they were going to get. The other question was, why, why did we do public schools when we, when we went for scale up? So when we went for scale up, basically uh, in, in Transoya there are about 500 or maybe around 450 primary schools of which about 30 were private and about 410 were um, public. So whatever funding we had was basically um, so to support where you would see the intervention would have maximum impact. And we also assumed that one of the decisions that we actually had to make was that most of the people in private schools were basically have their needs met. If you're able to afford or to afford to go to private school, most likely you, you're able to afford to basically have your child checked for any eye problem. That was the, the, the working theory behind that. So that's the reason why we chose to do public schools and we wanted to reach as many people as possible in the, in the community. That's why covering 410 people would actually, I mean, 410 people in public schools was more a public health intervention reaching more people than, of course, uh, if, if we had split, done a split. The other, of course, element was that we would have actually covered the extra 30 schools. But of course, the funding was not enough for all that. We would have wished to do that as well. But of course, there are also layers of, um, uh, layers of, layers of um, consent that you have to get and permissions you have to get when you go to private, private, private schools. Apart from the government ones, you still have to go to the owners, owners of the schools who have to contract the children. They have a, a series of layers in terms of um, doing studies in private schools. And it's quite a, a challenge there as well. So if you have a, a shorter period of time, you have to choose your, your, your areas quite well. But I think ours was more maximum reach, little bit, and then um, and the funding that we had. Yes. The last comment I had was more on the public attributes. Um, yeah, um, yeah. When, when I think you mentioned something about uh, if hospital Z goes and picks the patients from hospital A, I mean from region A, and the from region Z from region Y, the, then the question would be actually how do you uh, allocate or where where do you put those patients? At? I think critically most of that thing from a public health perspective, if you are looking at public health interventions you are looking at cataract surgical rates. If you look at cataract surgical rates of Nairobi, they are pretty high for Kenya. But if you look at uh, effective cataract surgical rates, basically it is not very high for Nairobi because most of the patients from Nairobi are, could be imported from elsewhere. Most of the, they could be brought from other areas. So the other question would be that I think uh, moving forward then it would be that the patients who are operated from a particular region would actually be entered in the, health information systems for that region, and that could actually account for effect, uh, effective public health interventions for that particular region. That, that, that is coming. I see it coming in the horizon. So, and thanks for bringing it up now. Thank you. I think that my, that's my comment for now. Um, I'll talk about the digital space later on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Rono, for that uh, rich addition to this discussion. And uh, I don't know whether there is anybody who has a comment or a question. Uh, Dr. Gishangi, would you like to comment, especially regarding the issue of uh, data ownership and the uh, trachoma research that has been going on in Kenya? Mm. 
Thank you, Dr. Kahaki. I hope uh, I can be heard because I'm on the road, but I've followed, I've managed to follow quite a bit of it. Now, yes, first, we can I, hear you. I, I, I appreciate the Dr. Moutier's approach to the whole aspect of um, ethics in public health practice. And um, what also came to my mind is that um, should, you, should you intervene if you are not intervening completely? For example, in trachoma at some point, there may have been some of the interventions with, without the other components of um, the safe strategy. And that was the question. Or is it um, best or the most ethical practice is to, to have all the components in place first? So that's something we can discuss and see how to manage it. Now, uh, on the, did you say uh, trachoma data in the cloud? The idea should always be the country should have the low data and should know or be the one sharing the data to any other external uh, participant or, or external stakeholder. At any one time, if get information about it, so that is that is all, uh, the, the reason why uh, the Data uh, Protection Act talks of uh, uh, it must be stored in the country. The low data must be stored in the country. Not all of it must be shared out, but it can all as well all be shared. But the country should be aware of what data is outside there. That's what I wish to say about the Trachoma Data and Data Protection Act. Unfortunately, the Data Protection Act had not come into place uh, when we were using tropical data. And uh, again, we had uh, a few issues with that. I, I, I don't want to say much more than that. As at the moment, uh, we are working very well with the um, Data Commissioner, the Office of the Data Commissioner, in facilitating or ensuring that uh, uh, any partnership that might need sharing or, uh, or sharing data, it is done appropriately. And we hope the ministry or the government uh, is a full custodian of the data. And uh, for example, in health projects, the Ministry of Health will be the uh, data controller. Thank you. I, uh, Dr. Rono can add on that or anybody else. Because we are working that in the context of um, peak, scaling up peak and the fact that we may have uh, some stakeholders who may need uh, some data. So we are, we are trying to follow the right process using the Data Protection Act. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gishangi, for that input. Um, uh, uh, we, we don't want to leave the floor just to a few people, and we would really like to hear what um, the experience has been on the ground. You know, we to Wanga different to ground. So maybe I don't know whether anybody else has had any experience when it comes like to the issues of, of data. Maybe I can comment by saying I, uh, I've been getting a lot of uh, requests uh, to share uh, retinoblastoma, uh, retinoblastoma data because I think Kenya is one of the countries with a very well established program and therefore we have managed a lot of patients and so I'm always being called for meetings and uh, for programs. And when you listen carefully, you hear all that they want is data. And uh, uh, somehow th that has become quite a difficult uh, ground to, uh, to navigate uh, without, because sometimes you also don't want to appear uncooperative. And uh, yet, you know, it is not right just to share a country's data without the relevant ethical approvals. 
I don't know whether there are any other experiences on the ground. Maybe uh, Rono, um, uh, Dr. Geshangi asked whether you'd like to add yeah. something. Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to comment, um, probably just a point of information. There's a lot of euphemism and a lot of words about what's a cloud. You know, a cloud is just, it's just a computer in a particular country, in a, in a particular space, which hosts information, and that information is transferred through internet. So you can actually have a cloud in Nairobi, you can have a cloud in Kitale, you can have a cloud, as long as that computer is directly dedicated to that specific data. So that's all about cloud. So it's not a big, big jargon about it, it's just a matter of uh, some marketing tool about it, but just internet connection to a computer in a particular place. So you can even have a cloud in Nairobi. That's what I wanted to comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rono. Any other comments? Uh, yeah, how are you, Dr. Uh, fine, thank you, Professor Karimurio. Karibu sana. Oh, yeah, I was traveling and I was listening to the presentation. I was on the road in Jamb and I want to congratulate Dr. Motie for such a wonderful presentation. And also say that the issues regarding ethics in public health, what we used to do in the 80s and 90s, things have changed. And it is very good that uh, nowadays now we have got so many public health ophthalmologists. It's not the only time you are very few. You are the ones who started. But there was the issues which I would uh, like to emphasize mm -hmm. that uh, especially the question of uh, qualitative data. When we say we are just going to talk to people, so we are not examining them. We should understand that nowadays, ethical consent is a mandatory requirement, even for qualitative studies or what we call CAP studies, knowledge, attitudes, and practice. Because as she has rightly said, we are intruding into somebody's psychological space. The other issue is we have to understand that when it comes to public health, it is not only individual consent, we are working in a political area. So it's both political and individual. So we must take the political consent, what we are calling community consent. We must also, when we enter a household, uh, we should uh, also talk to the head of the household. You can take a consent to the individuals, but if you don't uh, did not approach the head of household, you are also in trouble. So in public health, we are dealing with what I may call includes political issues and individual issues, and they must both require consent because you cannot approach a community without talking to the leaders. So I think that was a very good presentation and she has opened a lot of frontiers which we may need uh, to think about and maybe talk further beyond this presentation. So I think we should have another opportunity to discuss some of those issues which have been raised in this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Karimurio. Thank you for your input. <laughs> I don't know whether we have any comments. Uh, I think the, the, the chat has been very quiet. I'm not seeing any questions or comments also. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think one of the things that comes to mind and especially for uh, the ophthalmologists, especially in the counties, many times when people are, are, are looking for data, they, they will ask, ask for that data sometimes in a very roundabout manner. And sometimes you may even part with important information without realizing that actually they are infringing on your personal intellectual space. So, so I think this was a very important um, topic that uh, Dr. Mutie has really covered uh, quite thoroughly. Um, 
Um, since I'm not seeing any questions, I don't know if Dr. Mutia has the last uh, words about the, the presentation, but it has been a very, very um, wonderful presentation. And also the highlighting between the difference between ethical considerations, public health versus just research, that in itself is an eye opener to some of us. So I think it has been wonderful. And as Prof says, it's a good thing to think, to uh, plan for further discussions and actually get into the nitty gritties of everything. So I, I, I don't know if she would have a word and a comment before we can uh, close for today. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Kalu. And uh, thank you for the input. I really, really appreciate. Um, and uh, I think what I would want to challenge us is to re uh, wherever we are, we have lots of information that we could start generating our own data and that and, and um, utilizing what we have. And in the process, be able to bring out some of the these um, issues that need to be addressed. And that way we can build up our own evidence and even come up with, um, um, you can even come up with a new principle, who knows? I mean, all these things have been uh, uh, done by people like you and I. So I'll just challenge us to really pick up what we are doing and uh, bring it out. But of course, following all the uh, principles that we have discussed today. So thank you everyone for uh, uh, listening and I, hope that we can have more work coming out from amongst us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Kimani, any last uh, comments? I just have one, one last comment I just wanted to make. Yeah? And yes, for okay. all of us here, before, before Dr. Kimani comes in, um, for all, all of us who are here, when you have any new idea that comes in, please bring it forward because don't wait for an idea to be peer reviewed because once it's peer reviewed, it is no longer original because it, 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 has, it has been agreed by many people. But if it is original to you and is actually unique and you've come up with something new, just share it with, with a team or a group of people and just see if it can be a new uh, intellectual space that you can actually come in. And I encourage everybody just, just discuss among your peers and don't, don't fear to share your ideas and then we can advance those ideas. Uh, so be before an idea becomes peer reviewed, um, that's, the, that's an original, original idea. But once it's peer reviewed, it ceases to being um, an original idea because people agree with it. So that's how it would be like, but uh, only peer review comes in if, or if they agree in the science that you went through it, but share it for what you have. That's what I wanted to share with, with everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rono. I think from my side, I have no further comments. And uh, 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 Dr. Kalu, uh, please, uh, uh, I think uh, you can take over. I don't know whether there are any announcements or housekeeping. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kiman. Thank you, Dr. Mutie, uh, for being present today, taking your time and educating us and uh, facilitating such a wonderful discussion. Um, I would just uh, like to remind us that we will have a panel discussion coming next week um, concerning matters uh, uh, research and also touching a bit on our, our upcoming uh, conference, the OSK conference. So just keep tuned. Uh, more information will be available on our WhatsApp groups as we go on, but be prepared for an interesting evening coming next week. Other than that, I would like to thank everyone for uh, taking your time to join us today evening, and I hope you have a pleasant evening and a good night. Uh, thank you. You may live at your own um, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.